Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good. Hey, uh, I'm Joel. I'm the teaching pastor here, and um, excited to wrap up this final final message in our series, Run, which is actually preparation for our next series, which is called Run to the Battle. You're hearing a lot of the run theme, I'm guessing, this, this month. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like there's this momentum that's been building. I hear it all over pe- from people all over the, the, the world, really, that the world kind of locked down for about two years. But people are starting to say, now it's time to step up and we need to start moving forward. But know this, when you start to see momentum in your life, the quickest way to tell that you're actually getting momentum is when you start getting pushed back. If you start to move forward, don't be surprised if the forces of darkness don't go quietly into the night. They go, oh, can you you imagine the enemy going, oh no, she's gotten motivated now. I better just shut it down. Are you kidding? That's when they kick into full gear. The forces of darkness, the enemy, Satan, the guy that hates you, he's going to do everything he can to derail you. And I've been hearing all sorts of prayer requests this morning from people. They, man, they're having medical things that have just popped up. You're like, what, where, why is this stuff happening? Marriage issues. I mean, just all sorts of darkness is coming against the, the, the kingdom of God right now. And, and, and listen, don't be surprised by this. And Peter, it says, don't be surprised by these fiery trials as if this is something strange happening to you. There's this verse in Isaiah, I love it. And I, I quote this to myself all the time when I start to feel pushback. And I'm like, why is this happening? It says this, it says, strengthen your weak arms. Steady your feeble knees. Say to those with anxious heart, anxious hearts, be strong. Do not fear. The Lord will come. He will come with a vengeance and he will rescue you. And then it says, the eyes of the blind will then be open and the ears of the deaf will hear and the, the mute will shout for joy. And the people that are lame, it says they will leap like a deer. And then it says there's going to be streams right in the middle of the desert and we will see the glory of the Lord right in the middle of it. So we don't lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away. Inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory, which is beyond all comparison. So here's what we do. We fix our eyes not on what we see, for what we see is temporary. We fix our eyes on what is unseen, for what is unseen is eternal. And we are persuaded of this, that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing is able to separate you or me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this is the confidence we have. You say, I'm preaching. I'm just quoting the word of God, man. That's like all Bible verses. I didn't make that stuff up. It's too eloquent for me, right? Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus right in the middle of this. Amen. All right. I'm going to close in prayer. I'm going to go. No, I'm just kidding. That's not really the message. But I just want to encourage you guys with that. Man, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. If you're starting to take ground, don't be surprised when you get pushed back. That's what fighting back looks like. All right? Now I'm all motivated. Okay. So you guys, I've been hanging out here for about five years, and you guys know at this point that I've got issues, right? Y'all know that, right? We've all got them. This is one of the things I love about this church is everybody's got issues. <laughs> one of my issues is I have a really hard time getting excited about the things most people get excited about. Like, I don't, I don't get excited about things starting. Like weddings, people are like, woo, weddings, yay, weddings. And I'm like, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Because I've talked to so many people that are still paying off their wedding while they're filing the divorce papers. Sad, right? I don't get excited about weddings and everybody's like, well, why don't you get excited about those things? I'm like, I just don't know. Like, and I started thinking, is this something, is there just something really wrong with me? Or like, has this been from a long time? Or what happened in my childhood to cause this? I don't know. And I started realizing, I've thought this way for a long time. I'll never forget. So I'm a, I'm a pastor's kid, which is probably the source of a lot of my issues. But... I'll never forget when I was about nine years old, my dad was gone one, one day from church and the guy that was in charge of church got all excited about a guy who had just become a recent convert to Christianity. 
So we had the guy come up and he gives the guy a mic and he's this big old biker dude. And the guy gets up, he's like, oh man, Jesus saved my soul. He's like, just last week I was in a bar fight and I broke two guys' jaw and then I got thrown in prison, but they let me out by the grace of God. And here I am, I'm a changed man. And I'm thinking, should that guy be up on stage right now? He's only been into this thing for about five days. We don't know if he's a changed man. Maybe he's just off of drugs for a while and he's thinking clearly. And everybody's like, oh, hallelujah, what a great story. And I'm like, maybe it's a great story. We'll see how it turns out because here's what I've seen over and over again. This thing Jesus called us to is hard. G.K. Chesterton said this. He said, Christianity hasn't been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. When you get into this thing, you're like, you get all excited about the conversion. Woo, Jesus, hallelujah, I feel tingly. And then life hits. And you've got to decide to respond the way Jesus responds, and it gets really hard. And, and, and here's the thing. You can start off with a beautiful, exciting, powerful moment with Jesus, but are you, how's it going to look when you finish? Because here's one of the most important things to recognize is this. How you finish the race is way more important than how you start the race. That's true. That's true. That's true. And some of you guys have been bumbling around for a while with your faith, and it's time now that you weaken your feeble knees and steady your arms and step up. Because this is a long race that you need to run and you need to start stepping up to be all that God has called you to be, which is what we've been talking about here in Hebrews 12, because it's a long race, which is why what gets me more excited than weddings, oddly enough, is funerals. Because at funerals, you get to see the results of somebody's life. And I went to a funeral this week that was super awkward. It was awkward because it was a funeral of somebody that basically everybody had to lie about. You ever been to one of those? Yep. You're like, I'm not sure what... Well, we just know that they're in eternity. <laughs> Praise Jesus. Right? I'll never forget, uh, it reminded me of a, the first funeral I ever did as a pastor. And uh, I was an associate pastor and somebody came to the church and said, we need somebody to do a funeral. And I was like, ooh, cool. And I was all excited about pastoring back then. I was like, back before I knew that I'm a horrible pastor. <laughs> and they said, you want to do this funeral? So I did this funeral for somebody I totally didn't know. Now, I had never done a funeral before. I got a little black book that has all the funeral information. Like, that's what that black book is the minister has. It literally tells you how to conduct a funeral. If you're always wondering what that black book is, it's not their deep thoughts. It's like a pre-planned funeral. Anyway, so I'm reading through and it says, leave time for people to come up and speak about the, the, the deceased. So I said, we're going to leave time at this moment to speak about the deceased. Well, a guy comes up, and the first guy gets up. He's like, man, she was such a mean person. You know, she would, she would always beat me with a shoe and just say, I know you did something wrong, so I'm going to hit you. <laughs> and then he looked off in the distance and was like, but deep down, I'm pretty, I think she loved me. I was like, oh, that's a downer. I hope to, let's call somebody else up. So I was like, anyone else? And the guy gets up, and the next person gets up, and she goes, man, she was vicious. She would burn me with hot things, and she was mad. But I think that was her way of saying she loved me. And this string, I mean, I'm, this is my first time doing a funeral. I'm like, do I cut this off, like cut my losses? And like, oh, what do we do? Because it was clear this person was not a good person, and everybody was having to convince themselves, maybe even lie. Now, Here's what I know about everybody in this room. You don't want a funeral for you where people have to lie about you. Right? None of us in here wants a funeral where people have to lie about us. Oh, yeah, he, was a, he wore baseball hats all the time. That was, he wore baseball hats. He had a lot of cool baseball hats. Yeah, yeah. You know what? It's just as awkward funerals. We don't want that. But here's the thing, and you know, King Solomon said this in Ecclesiastes 7. Ecclesiastes is my favorite book of the Bible. Again, I told you I have issues. And it says this, it says, the end of a matter is better than the beginning, and patience is better than pride. What matters is how you finish this race. And that's what we've been looking at. And I want to talk today about how to brace yourself for the long haul, because life is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And you may have had a rough start, but that doesn't mean 
you can't have a glorious ending. But it requires taking some really hard steps that God asks of us. And that's what we've been looking at in Hebrews 12. We've been looking at the fact in Hebrews 12 that Paul says this, for the moment, all discipline, it seems painful rather than pleasant. Like, who likes discipline? Some people do, but I don't. I don't know any people. It's painful. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And then he jumps into something that kind of, throws me off because he jumps into that verse that I just quoted a minute ago from Isaiah where he says this. So lift your drooping hands. This is a paraphrase of this verse and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. He's basically saying, guys, I'm going to show you how to run this race with strength so that you don't crash and burn right in the middle of the race. And we're going to talk about something today that I have seen I've been hanging out in the church for over 40 years. I'm a pastor's kid. I've been serving in the church. And I've seen over and over again that what we're going to talk about today is probably the number one thing that derails good Christians. And it keeps them from achieving the fullness of the destiny that God has for them. This one thing today. And you're going to say, you're, you may doubt me, but I'm going to do my best to show it to you. Okay? So this is what Paul says. He says, strive for peace with everyone. Like, what does that have to do with this? What, what does all this have to do with this? We're going to explain that in a second. Strive with peace for, for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Yeah. Now, this is hard. Have you ever noticed it's hard to live at peace with people? <laughs> do you know why? It would, you know, it would be so easy to live at peace if people would just do what I want them to. But darn those people, always doing their own thing. Don't they know I know what's best for them? Peace would be easy if we didn't all have our own desires and wills. And you know what? Peace would be even easier if we were all perfect. But you know what? We ain't. I've got issues. And so do you. And your issues bump up against my issues. And we're all like just trying to get along, but it's hard. And that's why Paul says, strive. Now, let me make the first point here. People at war with themselves will never be at peace with others. Part of the first peace that you need to make is you need to make peace with God. And until you make peace with God and let him start working in your heart, you have no business confronting others. Until you decide to make your own bed, clean up your own house, that's what Jesus said. Hey, stop looking for log in their eye. Fix the speck. Then you can go approach them. But until you got that speck fixed, and, and here's what's fascinating about that is, the more you look at your deficiencies first, the more humble it makes you when you confront others. Like, hey, Hey, I want to talk to you about something I see in you that's a real problem, but I know it's a problem because I have the same problem. Instead of, how dare you do that? Be more like me. I am an amazing person. <laughs> yeah, but that's how we do it sometimes, right? We're like, I'm right, you're wrong. Let me show you where you're wrong. Mm. Meanwhile, people are looking like, anybody ever told you what's wrong with you? <laughs> You've got issues. Wow. So the first thing you need to do is you need to Learn how to make peace between you and God, and that's by surrendering to his will before you ever go try to make peace with anyone else because you'll never make peace with anyone else until you're in right relationship with God. Once that's in place, though, here's what you do. You've got to learn to humbly fight for peace in a God-honoring way. That's what he's saying here. He says, you do it with holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You've got to do it in a holy way, in a way that's set apart, in a way the world doesn't do things. You've got to be willing to confront. Now, I don't know many people that like confronting. It's a lot easier to just go, that's not worth fighting. And, and here's the really tricky part. As Christians, we often think that that's what Jesus would do. Oh, he went... He went to the cross and didn't say a word. I'm like, Jesus, no. 
Don't compare one element of who Jesus was to what you're choosing to do in this situation and say you're like Jesus because Jesus was very multifaceted. He also confronted things. And your failure to confront things means that you're not like Jesus. You gotta be perfect to be like Jesus. And what we often do, and this, and this is, this, there's certain personality types, you gotta understand something. Okay, so there's these big five personality traits, right? So it's like openness to experience, extroversion versus introversion. One of them's called agreeableness versus disagreeableness. Agreeableness is your willingness to just go along to get along to make peace, okay? And then this, this, this spectrum, we all fall somewhere in here. Most people in the world fall on the agreeable spectrum. In fact, statistically, this is not some sort of a sexist statement, women tend to fall on the agreeable side. So they just don't confront things. They're like, eh, we'll make peace. Men tend to be a little more disagreeable, okay? Now, there are women who are disagreeable, and there's a word that people have for them. It's a ba bad word. <laughs> But we need disagreeable women. We need them. If you're disagreeable by nature, we need you to be disagreeable, but do it from a pure heart out of holiness. Amen. So you're not just being crabby and grouchy, okay? Now, I took a test recently that said I am 100% disagreeable. I took that test and I was mad. I completely disagree with that test. I agree with, I'm agreeable sometimes. But most of us, we just go, choose to go along to get along. Now, my wife and I, and this is a challenge, okay? Typically, you have a disagreeable person in a marriage and an agreeable person. Sometimes you have two agreeable people, and they literally never have fights because they're always just kind of ceding to each other, but all this stuff is building below the surface. My wife has learned to be very disagreeable with me and because I need that. She'll fight back. And she's very, I'm very blessed that she has a very strong-willed father. So she learned early how to fight back. But a lot of us, we grew up in families where it's like all this stuff was kind of secretly done manipulatively under the surface and nobody ever said anything. And it was just kind of like backstabbing and all this underhanded stuff. And so you learn to just kind of be quiet and you do all your, your disagreeableness, fighting back in a really kind of devious way. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I know a lot of you grew up in families like that. So all the evil is done under cover. And you smile at each other. And, but yet there's all this bitterness seething inside. And until you choose to confront, and choose, until you choose to recognize, I'm prone to this over here, but I know there's some things that are worth fighting for if I'm going to have peace because peace isn't a default setting. A lot of people are like, well, it'll just be peace if I just do whatever he says. No, 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 that's tyranny. You know, Hitler just wanted peace on his terms. And a lot of times, this is where I see marriages explode. You see a very agreeable person, maybe two agreeable people, and in the name of love, or maybe it's in the fear of being abandoned, or maybe it's out of the fear of being rejected or humiliated, being left on your own, they never push back against their spouse because they're afraid they might leave them or they, there might be, and they're just like, it's just not worth a fight. And instead what happens is they end up living in a tyrannical setting where it's one person wants peace, but it's only on their terms. But that's not real peace, that's tyranny. If you're constantly surrendering to another person and feeling the resentment build, and this is where I see marriages explode because I see people that we all, for years, we like watch them and we're like, wow, they never even fight. They never even fight. Boom, marriage is over. Like, what happened? That was like the perfect marriage. Well, that's what you thought was happening. But what was happening in one of the spouses is they were doing everything the other one wanted. And then all of a sudden they just got frustrated. And they're like, I can't do this anymore. And they wake up and go, I'm out. I can't do it anymore. And sometimes they're just numb from it. They go, I don't even, I'm not even mad. I'm just numb. I can't do this anymore. I le I'm leaving. It's quiet in here. That happens a lot. And that's why we're so shocked. Right? But they were like the perfect people. Or this one I hear a lot of times people too, like, wow, like, but that person seems so at peace. They did yoga every day and meditated. Yeah, do you know why they had to do that? Because inside they were the seething mess of anger and they were trying to deal with it. And this is where the Bible is so brilliant, okay? I've been reading the Bible for 40 plus years and I'm still baffled by it. And especially Paul. This guy irritates the heck out of me. He says stuff that I'm like, Paul, what are you saying? 
But the more I read it, I mean, I've read this passage a hundred times and, and I, I saw a sequence this first time in 40 years. I saw a sequence this week while I was reading it that's fascinating because in psychology, we see over and over again that failure to confront something that's building in your life naturally leads to resentment and resentment naturally leads to bitterness. And here's what Paul says. He follows up this verse. He says, make sure you're trying to live at peace with everyone, even if that means confronting them, striving with them, wrestling with them, trying to figure out, okay, where can we come to an agreement? Because otherwise, here's what happens. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God and that no root of bitterness, it wasn't random that he put that in there, springs up and causes trouble, and by it, many become defiled. Whoa, what in the world? That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards, when he desired, again, this is one of the things like, Paul, what are you rambling about? But there's something here. When he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for, the, for, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Wow. Now, here, here's what I think the next second point is. Do not, if you want to run the long haul, do not let resentment, unforgiveness, and bitterness build. And in order to do that, you have to address some uncomfortable things. It's a lot easier to go, ah, I'll just be the bigger person. Or, ah, I'll just leave. This is why people leave churches all the time. Because churches are filled with messed up people with issues. And you bump into each other. And then you're like, oh, I don't like seeing them on Sunday morning anymore. And who are they to be leading that small group anyways? They're mean people. And instead of work it out, most people think, I'm going to be like Jesus and quietly sacrifice. But instead, they're not like Jesus. Instead, they're letting bitterness grow in them. Because here's the sequence. Ongoing offenses, small little things. You know, in marriage, King Solomon says in... Uh, in the book of Song of Solomon, he says, it's the little foxes that ruin the vineyard. It's the little ones that are just in there, like, taking a little one here, taking a little one. And you ever felt like you've been, you're getting eaten to death by ducks? <laughs> Not a pleasant feeling. It's like, ah, I'm getting pecked to death by ducks, right? It's the little ongoing offenses that slowly build resentment where you're going, they always, or they never. That's good, that's good. Right? Little things. Yeah. Emily and I, we, we, I have to watch myself when I say, she never puts away these dishes. <laughs> I go, oh, resentment's building. I need to address this. <laughs> Our battle this morning. She never remembers her sunglasses. So we have to get out of the car. And then she runs up to the car. This is our battle this morning. And the garage door is not open because I forgot. And she like, turns to me and she's like, Like, sorry, I forgot. And I'm thinking, I know she's thinking, he never pays attention to what I need. I disagree. <laughs> resentment builds. They always, they never, that's a sure sign you're feeling resentment, that there's something that needs to be addressed. And you may have been trying to live at peace with Hitler. <laughs> and the only thing Hitler's going to know, I'm not comparing you to Hitler, sweetheart. <laughs> I'm Hitler. <laughs> see, the, see the speck in my eye? Anyway. It builds and it builds and then what it turns into is bitterness. And you've all been around people that are bitter. And they pollute everything. They think everybody's trying to, you know, overrun them and abuse them. And they're just bitter. And it all started because you failed to confront something either within you that needed to be confronted or you failed to confront something in those you love because you thought it was a godly thing to not confront, but it's not godly. Confrontation is using wisdom and asking, Holy Spirit, I know that you're within me to give me wisdom and guidance. And there's some battles that aren't worth fighting, but if you are starting to feel resentment building into you, you need to consult that resentment and you need to go, hmm, it's not good that I'm feeling this way. Lord, what do I need to do? And he may ask you to do something really uncomfortable, something completely against your nature, and he may ask you to do some confrontation. And you do it humbly, you do it gently, and here's the really important thing. When you confront someone, 
always use minimum necessary force. Here's what tends to happen. It grows to the point of resentment and bitterness and you're ready to nuclear bomb them. Drop the mic, walk away. And you're like, gee, I showed them. And you may have showed them. But here's the problem. When you, just, when you vanquish the enemy and you conquer them and leave them bloody on the floor, they don't usually like hanging out with the person who's done that to them. Yeah. You may win the battle, but you lost the war. You use minimum necessary force. You say, what's the minimum confrontation necessary here for us to come to peace? Otherwise, it just gets really bloody and it gets ugly and it's not godly. Confrontation is godly. Ungodly confrontation, not godly. And that's where this fine line comes and we're always navigating it. And you may get it wrong sometimes and you may have to apologize. But confrontation is the key. You've got to be willing to confront your own demons, not ignore them, not numb out, not ignore the things that are happening around you. Confront the things in your children that you know need to be addressed. Confront your own behaviors. You need to confront your spouse if they're doing things that over and over again are making you go, they always, or they never. And you're turning bitter. And when, that's, when you start to feel those things, that's your sign that it's time to turn to the Lord and say, God, I need your wisdom for how to confront this because I need to strive to live at peace. And we don't have peace right now. It looks like peace on the outside, but inside I'm a seething mess. I'll leave that for a second to sit on that because I think we all know that. Like deep inside, there's some stuff in us that we know has been tearing us apart and we know we need to say some stuff, but we're like, well, Jesus would, what would Jesus do? Oh, he'd die on the cross. Nope, Jesus already died on the cross for everybody. You don't need to do it. What you do need to do is walk in the power he's given you to walk in the spirit life that he's given you, Hallelujah. living in his wisdom Hallelujah. that he gives you. The same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you and he'll give you wisdom for how to know how to confront things, but you do it humbly. And, and, and here's where the second part of what Paul said comes in. He says this, with the thing with that weird thing with Esau, it's like, what, did, what about Esau and sexual immorality? Why would Esau, what Esau sold his whole birthright for a, a cup of stew when he was super hungry? His brother's like, hey, I'll give you the stew if you give me your inheritance. And he's like, okay, yeah, that's fine, that's fine, whatever, whatever, whatever. And he eats it. And then he's, he's not getting his birthright back because he gave it to his brother. Go, what does that have to do with sexual immorality? Here's what I think both of them have to do with each other. Again, I don't understand the whole Bible. It's not a prerequisite for follower, being a follower of Christ. Not even a prerequisite for being a preacher. If any preacher ever tells you they're preaching the whole counsel of God, don't believe them. <laughs> like, you can't even figure out your spouse. How are you preaching the whole counsel of God? We do our best as preachers to humbly share what God has shown us to the best of our ability. So this is what I think this means. One of the elements. Don't fall for quick fixes that promise immediate relief. When the time comes that you need to confront something, bitterness is building in you, resentment's building in you. Don't check out and watch Netflix. Don't disappear to your room and turn on the TV. Don't drink yourself into oblivion. Don't run to the next closest female that can, you can pour out your sorrows on or the next closest male you can pour out your sorrows on when the marriage is falling apart. Don't settle for quick fixes. Lean into the confrontation that you wanted to avoid, but do it in a godly way. Humbly go in. First of all, you remember, get between peace between you and God. God, I got a mess on my hands. The kids, the marriage, the finances, the boss, I don't know what to do, but I can't keep living this way. First of all, Lord, is there anything in my heart? Search my heart and show me, is there any unclean way in me? Start from there. And he'll show you all the unclean ways. And then once you realize how messed up you are, you can gently, humbly go to the other person and say, hey, there's this thing that's been frustrating me that when you do it, it really gets to me. And I can't keep living like this, but I want peace. That's my goal here. My goal isn't to blast you. I want some peace. And you confront the issue and you keep striving for it. And it's probably not going to be one meeting. It's probably not going to be two meetings. It's probably not going to be three meetings. It's going to be an ongoing pattern of confronting and confronting and confronting. And, and, and there's this verse in, in Proverbs that says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. My wife is a wonderful gift to me. She sharpens me, but it ain't pretty while it's going down. <laughs> 
There's sparks. There's screaming. Sometimes Elise has to get in front of, between us and go, stop it. We all love each other. She literally says that. But she's making me better. I like to think I'm making her better. And she would agree because she's very agreeable. Does this make sense? So my goal isn't here for everybody to walk out and just confront everybody. Say, oh, I'm the person that cuts you off. In the name of Jesus. That's not my goal. I'm not trying to make you into fighters. I'm trying to make you into righteous people who recognize when it's time to address something that's causing an impure heart and bitterness and resentment to grow within you. And if you'll do that, man, you can win this race in the long haul. And bitterness won't build. And then at your funeral, people aren't going to go, because here's the worst part. As you get older, you either get better, bitter or you get better. That's good. That's good. That's true. And we've all met bitter old people. Don't be one of those people. Amen. Start walking in the purity of heart that comes that you're just going to get better and better. And as you get older and you walk, you're like, yeah, man, I've got issues, but so do we all. So I'm going to be patient with them. I'm going to confront where I need to confront. And I'm going to trust that the Holy Spirit is going to guide me as I do that. You guys receive that? Yeah. All right. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that you have given us the power to live at peace with one another. You've given us the power to address things and confront things. I pray, Lord, that we would just have wisdom as we do it. Pray for those here this morning that know there's some things they need to confront in their marriage, with their boss, with themselves, stuff they've been lying to themselves about, with their kids. Lord, I pray you give them, first of all, the humility to say, Lord, search my heart and know me. If there's any unclean way, I mean, show it to me. And then I pray, Lord, as they feel the call, they go and come from front, they would do it in a God-honoring way. And as we sharpen each other, iron sharpening iron, Lord, I pray that the air would be cleared between us, that peace really would be forged, a real strong peace that's not built on tyranny, one person just backing down all the time, but a truly strong peace where it's two strong individuals that have pushed up against each other and said, here's where we get peace. And I just pray that for everyone in here. If you're here this morning and you have not made peace with God, uh, you don't have your relationship right with him, this is your chance. I'm going to say a prayer in a second. If you say this prayer and you mean it in your heart, God's going to come in. This is the start to walking on a journey with him. If you say this prayer and mean it in your heart, he's going to come and transfer you from the kingdom of darkness, forgive all your sins, transfer you to the kingdom of light. It starts by saying this prayer. Let's say it all together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. In your name, amen. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings. <laughs>